you guys are uh, probably, we probably have more in common than I uh, initially would have thought, which is really cool for me. Um, I don't know, best part about this channel is connecting with all of you guys, so probably one of my earliest experiences of getting tingles and getting that disarming sleepiness, um, overwhelming comfort and, and stress relief or something was a kid in elementary school, or maybe in my home and having a book read to me. So, let's begin chapter two, and um, the first one was an experiment, so I'm going to try to knock out two chapters, and uh, we're going to just uh, press on, press forward through this epic journey. Odysseus remembers trying to get to Ithaca. his brother and the cause of the entire war. The cause of the war was Helen of Troy. And then the main gods, Athena, Zeus, Poseidon, Zeus's daughter, Zeus's brother, brother, god of the sea, Aeolus, god of the wind, Hermes messenger, Hyperion, which uh, I thought the sun god was Apollo, but perhaps they are different facets of the uh, different sides of the sun. They represent maybe different things. And last, the most 
most relevant part to us here is uh, is the Circe, the goddess of enchantment, Calypso, the goddess of silence. 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 And the most important for tonight's episode is Polyphemus, a cyclops, the son of Poseidon, which kind of gives you a personality analysis of uh, Poseidon, maybe. It's this very phallic symbol, holding a phallic thing. One eye has very focused attention, not very versatile, is extremely passionate about one thing. Let's find out. So Odysseus and his men sailed on sad and weary until they reached land again. They reached land again. Although they did not know it, they had come to the country of the Cyclops. These huge, fierce beings have only one eye each, right in the center of their forehead. They do not farm, relying instead on the good will of Zeus, whose thunderbolts they make. They make Zeus's thunder. Also, although they neither plow nor sow, their crops still grow. They can live in caves high in the hills, and each of them makes his own laws. So they don't abide by anybody else's laws. And as a consequence of that, perhaps they don't work together very well. The crews beached their boats in a fine harbor, close to a spring of fresh water and a grove of black poplars. They slaughtered some goats and ate and drank, then slept at ease. This delightful spot. When the first flush of dawn was in the sky, Odysseus picked twelve of his men and set out to explore. They climbed until they came to a cave with a courtyard of wood and stone. It was clearly the home of some shepherd. Clearly the home of a shepherd, for there were sheep. Let us take as many of these cheeses as we can carry, drive the animals onto the boats, and set sail before this shepherd returns, said Polites, one of Odysseus's most trusted companions. From the looks of it, he must be a giant. But Odysseus replied, at home in the Cyclops' cave. They lit a fire and killed a sheep. After they had offered the gods the portion due to them, they ate. At last, they heard the heavy tread of the Cyclops. Flocks and carrying a huge 
bundle of wood to make a fire. He closed the entrance behind him with an enormous boulder so big that 24 wheeled wagons would be unable to shift it. Then he settled down to milk the sheep and the goats. Something troubled the cyclops at his work, a strange scent. He began to sniff the air, and searching the cave, he soon discovered Odysseus and his men cowering in the corner. Who are you, and where do you come from? he roared. We are Greeks, come from the sack of Troy, said Odysseus. Show us, we beg. you respect the gods, for Zeus himself looks after travelers. And I look after myself, replied Polyphemus. We Cyclops do not fear the gods, for we as are as strong as they are. Nevertheless, I may choose to spare you. Tell me, how did you come here? Did my father Poseidon allow you to travel freely over the waves? Is your ship moored nearby? Odysseus, guessing that the giant would destroy their ships and murder the crew, replied, Our ship was dashed against the rocks by great Poseidon and sank. My companions and I are the only survivors. Polyphemus asked no further questions. Instead, he reached down and plucked two men from the huddled group. He swung them by their ankles and dashed their brains out against the wall. He then tore them limb from limb and devoured them raw like a ravening animal. The others looked on in terror. Polyphemus washed his meal down with milk and went to sleep. As the Cyclops lay snoring on the floor, Elpinor, the youngest of Odysseus's men, urged Odysseus to kill him. Slide your sword in between his ribs just there. That should finish him off. It would finish us off, too, replied Odysseus. For how could we escape? Only the Cyclops is strong enough to budge the rock that seals us in here. No, no, no. We must wait and see what the new day brings. At dawn, Polyphemus rose and made a gruesome breakfast of two more of Odysseus's companions. He gathered his flocks and set out for the pastures, closing the rock door behind him. Odysseus and the remaining eight men were left to tremble in the cave, waiting for nightfall and the return of the Cyclops. At last Odysseus spoke. It may be that this Cyclops will eat us all and that our only choice is between a swift or a slow death. But it may be that we can fool this giant. I have with me a goatskin full of dark wine, given me by the priest of Apollo. This wine is so potent that it should be diluted with twenty parts spring water. I shall offer it to the Cyclops tonight, and if he drinks it, he will fall into a fuddled sleep. Then, with 
this man laid it in the ashes of fire to harden, and finally they hid it out of sight. Polyphemus returned and again drove his flocks into the cave. Boom, 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 boom. The Cyclops gorged himself once more on human flesh. He then sat down to drink some milk, and Odysseus went up to him, saying, Cyclops, you have caused my companions to drink the black wine of death. If you are to feast, if you are to feast on men's flesh, you should at least send them on their way with honor. here I have here I have here a goat skin of fine wine which I had brought to you as a gift let me pour you a bowl full the Cyclops drained the bowl in a single swallow wiping his great blubbery lips he said tell me your name little man for I wish to make you a present in return for this wine Pour me some more. Three times, three times, Odysseus filled the bowl, and three times the Cyclops drank it down. At last the fumes from the wine began to fog his head, and then Odysseus said, You ask my name, and I will tell you. It is no Well, nobody, I will eat you last. That is my gift to you, replied Polyphemus. As the wine overcame him, he sank to the floor. His great head lolled to one side, and as sleep tugged him under, he belched forth a vile mouthful of wine and human flesh. Odysseus and his men took the stake that they had made out of the olive wood and laid it into the fire until it was red hot, begging courage of the gods. Four of the men took the stake and plunged it into the giant's single eye. Odysseus above twisted it to and fro to drill it home. The eye bubbled and hissed with a sound like a smith tempering iron in cold water. <laughs> Polyphemus awoke, shrieking in agony. He plucked a stake from his forehead and hit out wildly. But Odysseus and his men could easily dodge the blind, blundering giant. Polyphemus' screams resounded through the hills, waking the other Cyclops in their high caves. They all rushed to help him. When they arrived outside the cave, he called, What is the matter? Who is attacking you? They called. And Polyphemus replied, Nobody is attacking me. Nobody has tried to kill me. The other Cyclops were indeed puzzled by this answer. But every time they asked Polyphemus who was to blame, he just wailed. Nobody. Nobody. If nobody is attacking you, there's nothing we can do. You must ask your father Poseidon to help if you are suffering some torment of the gods. And the Cyclops went away. (laughs) 
blew from this grope to round the cave for Odysseus and his men, but he could not catch them. So he pushed the boulder away from the entrance and sat there himself with his great hands outstretched to catch anyone trying to escape, including nobody. And when the dawn came, when the dawn came, the sheep began to file out of the cave as they were accustomed to do. And Polyphemus felt each one as it passed. But crafty Odysseus had tied them together in groups of three so that a man could cling beneath the belly of the middle one and go undetected. And so his six remaining men, his companions, escaped from the cave. When, o when it was Odysseus's turn, there was only one ram left, a big, fat creature. That was the best in all the flock. Odysseus clutched the shaggy fleece tightly, and with his face pressed to its rank-smelling belly, sent it walking towards the giant. As it passed, Polyphemus hugged it close to him. It's you, my beauty, he said. Normally you are the proudest of all and the first to leave the cave. Today you have lingered out of sadness for your master. But I promise you nobody shall never escape me. Now join your fellows in the meadow. And he let the ram go. Once clear of the cave, Odysseus and his men drove the sheep down to the ships and made haste to put out for the sea. Knowing that the Cyclops made no boats, and could not follow them into the salt waves. When they were the length of a man's shout from the shore, Odysseus cried, Cyclops, are you listening? It is I, nobody. You scoffed at Zeus, and the hospitality due to a guest. Now you must suffer for your evil ways. At this the giant was so outraged that he hurled the massive boulder from the cave entrance at the ship. It landed in the sea with such a tremendous crash that the waves from it drove the ship back onto shore. As Odysseus and his men rowed frantically out to the sea again, Elpenor pleaded with Odysseus not to anger the Cyclops further. Next time, he said, he may aim better. But Odysseus was too proud to remain silent. Cyclops, he shouted. If anyone asks who blinded you, tell them it was Odysseus, prince of Ithaca. It was my wits that breached the walls of Troy, though they were built by Poseidon himself. And it was I who made a fool of you. And here we see the beautiful, really beautiful portrait of Odysseus and his men. Of course, Odysseus going last. Being the bravest. Being their leader. Clinging to the underside bellies of the sheep as they walk three by three three by three three by three and finally with Odysseus clinging under the belly of the Cyclops' pride ram they go past the great Cyclops
Odysseus. Odysseus and his men rowing past, trying to dodge the great boulders, actual mountain tops being flung into the sea by the Cyclops. So Polyphemus let out a terrible groan. It is my fate that this has happened. A wise man foretold that I would lose my sight at the hands of Odysseus. But I thought Odysseus would be a great hero, strong and tall, not a puny weakling like you. Then he stretched out his arms towards the sea, calling the great, great Poseidon Earth Shaker, Lord of the Waves, hear me. If I am your son, and if you are my father, grant me this. May Odysseus never see his home again, or if he does, let him come alone and friendless to a house of trouble and sorrow. That was his prayer, and Poseidon heard it. And then Polyphemus threw another great rock. This one fell just, 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 just short of the ship. And its waves sent Odysseus and his men out to sea. There Odysseus sacrificed the ram on which he had escaped and prayed to Zeus for his help. But Zeus would do nothing to turn aside the anger of his brother, Poseidon. And so ends the chapter on the island of the Cyclops.